I am very excited to announce Caleb Kim, who will be our guest speaker too for today. Welcome. Thank you, Caroline. So today's scripture is as is on the screen, Genesis 32, 22 through 32. So if you flip there, we can read it together. All right. <clears throat> this is the word of God. Uh, the same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the break of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But the man said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is the word of God. All right. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Caleb Kim. I am one of the young adults here uh, at LGM. Um, I also help lead the Bible study on Wednesdays. Um, a little bit more um, about me is that I am a medical student at the University of Washington School of Medicine, um, but I'm currently taking a gap year or research year um, and doing some research at the University of, Mich uh, University of Michigan. And what brought me here is that my wife is a medical student at U of M. If you haven't had the chance to meet her, her name's Esther. Um, and so I'm really honored to be asked to speak in front of you all uh, today. And just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. And today I'm going to be sharing a, a preachimony, which is part sermon, part testimony. Um, and so with that being said, before we get started, um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you so much for just this beautiful day, uh, this afternoon that we could come together um, and worship in this place. Um, I thank you for just this beautiful home that we're able to share as a church and as a community. Um, I thank you for this building and for all of its members, um, including uh, Pastor Steve. Um, I'm so thankful that you're able to give him uh, the rest that he deserved during a sabbatical and for bringing him back uh, to be with us. I just pray uh, just for the duration of today's service, Lord, that it just goes to you in worship um, and that all the glory and honor is toward you. I pray that you help me during uh, this time of speaking, Lord, and that ultimately, no matter how well or poorly I speak or, or share, Lord, that um, you just take this time for yourself, that we can uh, find rest in you and that you can be glorified. So thank you again for this time, uh, for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so who here has a guilty pleasure? Anybody? So what a guilty pleasure is, it's an activity or something someone enjoys, although they may feel, may feel judged for it. And for me, I have a pretty big guilty pleasure, and it's been a guilty pleasure of mine since probably sixth grade, and that is WWE, or <laughs> professional wrestling. It's something that I genuinely very much enjoy. And up here, you see uh, John Cena, he is a WWE superstar and one of my favorites. Um, uh, another favorite of mine was Rey Mysterio. He is a short Hispanic man who is uh, really cool. He always wore this mask that you can see here. And part of his shtick is that he's the ultimate underdog. He is very small. And um, another cool thing about him was that mask that he always wore. The mask that he wore helped him kind of add an element of mystery, hence his name Ray Mysterio, uh, helped him kind of seem more menacing despite his short stature, and it made him seem fearless and, and confident um, as he went about fighting these, these larger, larger men. And this 
um, in a lot of way, uh, ways reminds me of uh, Jacob. We've been studying the life of Jacob in Bible study, and he is someone who in a lot of way puts, uh, ways puts on a mask. In Genesis 27, he famously uh, puts on the clothes of his older brother uh, and puts on some goat skins and puts on a show. He goes and deceives his, his father and his family to obtain um, his blessings. And it's a, it's a, it's a really bold act um, and an act of, of bravery in some sense, when in reality, Jacob was very afraid. In verse 12 of that chapter, uh, he says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to him a, uh, to be a mocking to him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. And that verse goes to show that, that Jacob with, with the goat skins, with the clothes, still felt very small and very scared and nervous inside. And so um, what else do we know about Jacob, who is the, the, the man who was mentioned earlier in the, in the passage? He is a careful, cautious guy, but also uh, very fearful. He's, he's ambitious, he wants to obtain this blessing, but he's insecure and seeks uh, affirmation. And in a lot of ways, that reminds me of myself. Um, to help paint this picture, I wanna go back to high school. Um, high school for me was a pretty difficult time. Uh, it was a hard time mostly because I was not very cool. And that was something that bothered me a lot in high school. Um, I, I think if you, you, if you think of like high school musical or, or other high school settings, maybe your own high school experience, there's kind of like the cool kids, not cool kids. And for me, I was definitely in the latter camp. And while I had some friends that I'm very grateful for, a lot of times I felt lonely. I suffered a lot from FOMO. I, saw, I, I worried about not being included. And there's a few really like core memories that unfortunately have stuck with me through, uh, during that time in high school. One, one, uh, episode, one episode or something that happened to me was I remember in eighth grade in middle school, um, I had this friend or someone who I thought was my friend and we were arguing about what classes to take in high school and we're arguing, arguing, and then he said to me, Caleb, why are we even arguing? I'm not even gonna be friends with you in high school. And that really stuck with me. It made me really, really sad. Um, and it kind of helped develop this, this, um, uh, this, ask, this part of me where I really feared what other people thought you know, do they think I'm cool? Do they think I'm worth being around? Why was this guy who was my friend kind of say something like that to me? Did they think I wasn't smart enough or anything like that? Um, and it kind of led to me constantly seeking the affirmation of others, which was not really healthy. And it helped, uh, it led to me really being very kind of almost obsessed of what other people thought of me. And so coming to college, I went to the college at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I was, and I came to college really just desperate to be accepted. And to do so, I wanted to present myself in the way that I wanted to be, uh, be perceived. I wanted to be mysterious, fearless, confident, just like my favorite uh, superstar, Rey Mysterio and Jacob. So to do so, I put on uh, my costume, which was a Hawaiian t-shirt, a turtle necklace, and uh, carrying around a penny board. And trust me, in 2016, this was drip, all right? This was, this was like, I, I thought I was so cool, and I remember, I remember um, the first Sunday of my freshman year of college, I came to church, and the church that I went to was kind of similar to this, I came to church 30 minutes late, riding my penny board, and I went right down the middle aisle and sat in the front row, because I was cool, you know, because I was like mysterious, I was cool, and I didn't, and I, and I just thought I was all that, and it was ridiculous, but it actually, in some ways it worked, because actually, that's actually the first time my wife had met me, and she has now since told me that, she thought I was so cool. And so it kind of worked. <laughs> but unfortunately, the facade in our relationship faded quickly. But at least it was a good start. And so why, why did I do this? Uh, so, so going back to Jacob and the mask and the costume that he put on, what was he even trying to get? And so as I mentioned earlier, he tried to get this blessing from his father. And so... This blessing from his father Isaac, this ancient blessing, it's a little bit different from our current use of the word blessing of like, bless you or, or anything like that. It was, it, was, it was an important kind of statement. It, was, it had important implications in power, family, society, wealth. It was saying, this is the blessing I give to you. And in some ways, it was also like a fortune. It was a statement from, um, from your father uh, that your life will be as I bless you. And so in a lot of ways for Jacob back then, it was something that, was, that seemed to be worth chasing because it had a lot of uh, implications on how the rest of his life would turn out. And so 
Um, Jacob does this where he puts on that, that costume, the fur, and he actually gets the blessing successfully. Um, but his life doesn't get that much better. He ruins his relationship essentially with his brother who he steals a blessing from and um, his father. He has to run away from home fearing his life uh, because his brother whom he stole the blessing from says like, I'm going to kill you. So he has to run away from home and he never sees his family or um, his, his mother or father. Or he sees his father again but doesn't see his mother again. And Jacob's life after securing this blessing, this thing that he, he masked up for, uh, he, he's kind of the same guy. He continues to uh, be as his name is. What Jacob in the ancient Hebrew means is to grasp at the heel. Famously, when he was born, he's born second to his brother Esau and is clinging on to his heel. And so Jacob means to grasp at the heel, also to supplant, to circumvent, to cheat, to bargain. And this continues to be a theme throughout his life. He deceived his brother Esau. He deceived his, bro his father Isaac. When he's on the run, God comes to him and actually in a dream, and he kind of bargains with God as well. And then he finally comes to this place where he lives with the uncle, and he, and, he, and he deceives and bargains with him too. And so he just kind of ends up being the same guy despite getting that blessing that he de so desperately wanted and that he put that costume on for. And in a similar sense, I relate to that because I also really wanted the world's blessing. I wanted, as Jacob wanted from his father, I wanted that acceptance. You know, I wanted affirmation. I wanted to fit in, and I put on that costume, and I, and I don't even know if I got it, to be honest, but my life didn't get any better. In that same way that Jacob was defined and continued to grab heels and, and deceive people, I, in college, was, was continuing to grasping for approval. I uh, did all the things that social media and, and movies and people around me told me to be. I, I, dr I obviously I dressed a certain way. I talked a certain way. I went to, to parties. I, I, was, yeah, I tried drinking because I thought this is what you were supposed to do. I thought this is how I thought people would come to like me or want to be around me. Um, and so I did that. You know, I, I successfully acquired some invitations to some parties. Hooey, hooray. Um, and a lot of my freshman year of college was kind of like around that and my life was the same. I wanted, pe I wanted people to want me to be around them, but the people that I wanted to be around didn't really want me around anymore, if that makes sense. I mean, they tolerated me, uh, you know, they had me around, but it was, they didn't really want me. And I got, as I got more just desperate for, you know, affirmation and acceptance, these invites, it felt more like performances, you know, maybe if I, you know, drink a little bit more, if I'm a little bit funnier, or if I'm a little bit cooler, then, then finally this thing that I've wanted since, since middle school and high school that I would, have, I would have. But I was unsuccessful, and it ended up, ended up feeling uh, very, very lonely, um, and that no one really saw me for who I am. But this is a happy story, and so things change for the better. Um, and so this brings us finally to our passage, which is, Genesis 32, where Jacob wrestles with God. And so back to the life of Jacob. Um, after running away from his family, after uh, running from his brother, Jacob spends like 15 years with his uncle. And he actually does pretty well, but there eventually comes a time after those 15 years where God says, come back home. And it's good timing because although he was with his uncle, Jacob's life, as I mentioned before, didn't really get that much better. He had some... He was building some wealth, but then his uncle was turning on him. The people around him still didn't want him around. And so Jacob, still seeking for, for some peace in life, says yes when God says, go back to your home where your brother and Esau is. And he, sees, he says, says yes, but he's scared. Because back home is where the big bad Esau is. And Esau is, is just the biggest problem in, in Jacob's life. Um, he has a problem since birth, growing up, Jacob was the cool guy, the gruff, outdoorsy guy whom his dad really loved. And, and Jacob was like, like, like more timid, sensitive, described as having like smooth skin. Um, and, and a lot of times growing up, Jacob felt like, man, if Esau wasn't there, if he wasn't, if I was born before him, then I'd have my blessing. I'd still be at home and I'd feel accepted and I'd be comfortable and I'd have peace. Um, but as I mentioned before, he's now being obedient to God. So he has to go and confront this, this big bad, this big conflict in his life. Um, but 
But going home, he's scared. And he's kind of the same guy where he Jacobs as hard as he can or he bargains or tries to circumvent his brother as much as he can. And so he takes all of his stuff and divides it into two. One side, on all, half of his stuff on this side, the other half of his stuff on this side. And he thinks, man, like if, if Esau comes in and seizes or takes my stuff, at least I'll have the other half and I could go and I'll make a run for it. And he's scared and he thinks, you know, this is, this is the moment where everything happens. I, I might not even uh, uh, escape with my life. And he starts praying. But this prayer is kind of like how some of you would pray like before a test or how I pray before a test where, you know, you don't, it's not like you have this really intimate relationship with God. But I, I remember sitting you know, in my oral class in college as well, just thinking, Lord, help me out. Throw me a solid. And that's kind of, that was kind of the tone that I felt, I, I thought his prayer was like. And after doing all this stuff, he waits Esau alone and in the dark. And that brings us to a passage where um, here Jacob was left alone. And then a mysterious man appears. Kind of like the undertaker. <laughs> so it's in the dark. Picture me this. It's in the dark. And a mysterious man appears. And back then, there's no like street lights. There's no flashlights. He's in the dark by himself, and just in the moonlight, there's a silhouette of a, of, a, of, a, of a man whom he doesn't know. And if you know who this is, he's another WWE superstar, and he has this really cool theme song that when he comes in, it's like a bell. It's like, dung, and then everything's kind of quiet, and it's very menacing. And so Jacob and the mysterious man um, wrestle, and they wrestle essentially to a standstill all night, hours on end, until sunrise. And finally, the mysterious man uses his finishing move. And back to pro wrestling, the finishing move is the coolest part of a pro wrestler. Some, some finishing moves you might know is like the RKO, the Stone Cold Stunner. These are, these are like the coolest moves that you can do that end the match. And, and, and when that happens, the, the superstar is victorious. And he does the hip touch. And the match is over. Jacob's on the ground, hip dislocated, paralyzed and in pain. And the man, the mysterious man says, like, let me go. Like, I won. But Jacob says, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so what's, what's going on here? And so in a, in a real life wrestling match, not with the costumes and with the, the music, but with the tights, um, you try to get away from your opponent. And so Jacob goes from trying to hold off this man to holding on to him. And I think the answer as to why Jacob has this kind of change in strategy comes a few verses later. Um, when Jacob names the place that they wrestled, um, he names the place Peniel, which means the face of God. And I think in that moment when Jacob goes from pushing the man away to holding on to him, he realized in that moment that he, that he was wrestling with face-to-face -face God, and he had survived. And God in this time, of course, there's no Old Testament, there's no Torah at this time, but it's, it's a, in, in the, this ancient uh, in this ancient time, this is a lot of this was like oral tradition. So a lot of what Jacob probably knew about God is probably from his father Isaac and from his father, uh, his grandfather Abraham. And so this is, he realized this is God of his fathers Abraham and Isaac. And God earlier in Genesis is described as being a dreadful and great darkness, like very, very menacing, more, more menacing than this, like very, very, very scary. And I think when they're wrestling, Jacob realizes that after this man, this presence of God had touched him on the hip, that this man, God, could obliterate him at any moment. And he was just there, face to face with him, holding on to him. And I think this is a moment where everything changes for Jacob. He begins to hold on to God and demand to him, bless me. And this is the same way that he was desperate uh, and asking for a blessing from his father in, in, that, the, in the blessing that he's demanding from God. It's actually the same word, uh, Barak, in the ancient Hebrew. Barak, like, like uh, Obama's first name. And this is his, this is his aha moment. Because up until this point in his life, Jacob pulled every work, every sham in the book to obtain that blessing from his father. But his life continued to be a mess. Yeah, he did these things his own way, but he couldn't be home. He couldn't be at his uncle's place. He was still that same kind of small guy who was fearful and insecure. But now in the climax of his life, face to face with this God that he realizes is this big, uh, dreadful presence, he realizes that he had it all wrong. It was in uh, God in his arms who had came down to wrestle with him and to fight for him that he realizes that this God uh, this God is wrestling for, ultimately, for his heart. God had came down and Jacob, 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 
he pulled his heel and pulled him into this wrestling match. And God is there talking to Jacob saying, Jacob, do you see me? Don't you see that I've been with you? It actually happened that earlier in his life when God had met with Jacob in a dream that God had already given Jacob his Barak 14 years ago in his life. But Jacob had functionally ignored this and instead continued living in his own way. And Jacob's realizing as he's wrestling, as he wrestled with God, that he realized that it's his relationship with God that truly is the biggest problem of this life. Because this God, who is God of the universe, God of his forefathers, is there with him, fighting for him. And it took God in the flesh to come down, mano a mano, hand to hand, skin to skin, to come down to earth and shake some sense into Jacob. He says to Jacob, see my sovereignty, but see my love. Don't fear Esau, don't fear the world, but fear me, the Lord Almighty. I have you, and I wish you could just see how, who you are in my eyes. And it took this dramatic episode for Jacob to, never, to, to realize, and he was never the same in his life. And this was symbolized by this limp, um, as we see later in this passage, that he has for the rest of his life as evidence of God who had came down, seized him by his heel, uh, and seized his trust and his heart. And so, I mean, what a beautiful story. But how, you know, how does this relate to my life? Because I feel like it really does. Because I mentioned before, I was, in some sense, like still am, a, an approval grasper. I just saw the need for acceptance and affirmation. I saw that as the biggest problem of my life. As, and I just thought, like, ah, maybe if I just acted a certain way, or if I said the right thing, then people would want me. God, at this point in my life in college, had already presented himself to me. I'd gone to church. I participated. I went to retreats, mission trips, prayed a little bit, prayed before tests. Um, but I, 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 up until that point in my life, I still try to take things into my own hands. I didn't fear God. I didn't trust him. I just tried to, try to do things as I thought would bring me that, that happiness that I wanted, that acceptance. But it wasn't until college that God had rocked my world and wrestled me back into his arms. In that haze where I was grasping, desperate for acceptance, uh, for, and was really just so, so desperate for people to like me and see my worth, um, God encountered me. And I remember very, very actually vividly, very specifically, it was, it was my sophomore year of college where I went to, did my thing, went to a party. I remember it was with my roommate and, uh, so it was in my room. We went. It was it was the Asian Student Association party. I remember it was upper campus, and we went. We were drinking, but I remember, it was so lame. I remember just sitting on the couch with my roommate, just like yeah, like doing the thing. But I remember getting back home with him, and and we were just on the couch talking. It's funny. This guy's actually he's a pastor now, and he got married this year. And I love the guy. But he, I remember he he walked into my room. I think it was actually sometime later that week, and he was like, Caleb, I don't want to live like this anymore. And I remember sitting there thinking like. Hold up. I don't either. You know, I just like, I realized like, I, I, you know, I walk this walk, I try to be this guy. And, and it was that moment where I realized that I, I want to take this mask off. No more pretending. I don't want to be constantly worrying and putting on a show and putting on an act. And that's where around that time that really that God showed me acceptance. He said to me, Caleb, I love you just the way you are. You don't need to wear that stupid necklace anymore. <laughs> you don't need to put on an act. But I love you in all your quirks, all your bad jokes, your bad breath, your anxieties. And I felt, and that was kind of that first time in my life where I really felt the warm embrace of God. Um, he provided, um, and, and, that, and, and it was in that moment also where I, I, I kind of went as Jacob did and went to really grab, to hold on to him. And the Lord provided and filled my cup several times over. He blessed me with friends, um, friends who, like my, or friends to, uh, with me to this day, who wanted to be around me, who thought I was actually kind of funny, I don't know, worth being hanging out with. He blessed me with a community of, of a place where I could feel like I could be wanted and, and that I could serve. He blessed me uh, with a beautiful wife who saw past my outfit and saw someone who was still worth loving. Um, and now, again, now and again, I still, I still worry. There's still a part of me that, that worries about how I'm perceived. Um, 
the most recent example I can think of this is in medical school. It's like the first day of medical school, it's like the first day of school all over again. But then it's like, it's not so much like, are you cool? But it's like, are you smart? And I remember like going in and there's so much imposter syndrome because because you go in and everyone's a superstar. Everyone did this crazy research project, is from some Ivy League school or whatever. And I was just a dude um, who felt very fortunate to be there. And I, remember, and I remember thinking like, oh gosh, I hope they think I'm like smart. But when this happens, I, I think this is, this is my limp. This is the times where I remember how God wrestled me back into his arms and I could take a deep breath and just remember that he has me, that he fought for me. And that in his eyes, I am valuable and I'm loved. And it, and it, it, it helps me remember that it's okay. Um, so in conclusion, um, our stories are unique. I don't exactly expect your story to mirror Jacob's or my own. But my presumption is that each one of you is somewhere on your journey with God. And wherever you are, I hope that the stories of Jacob and uh, my own life can be relatable, encouraging, and maybe even stir something in your heart. God came down to Jacob and met him hand to hand, face to face, skin to skin, in an intensely vivid and intimate way um, and wrestled for his heart. And, and later on, God came down again for us all in the flesh as Christ Jesus to fight for us and again demonstrate for us his um, ferocious love. And so he wrestled Jacob, he wrestled me, and I believe he is squaring up to wrestle for you. So let's hold on to him tight, just like how WWE superstar Kurt Angle locked in his submission hold, the ankle lock on Stone Cold Steve Austin to win the WWE Championship in 2001. And for further reference, that's you and that's the Lord. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I thank you so much um, just for this day um, and for a Sunday to be able to come together just as a church um, to worship you, Lord. Um, you are so worthy um, of our praise and we constantly fall so short, but Lord, you remind us again and again how much you love us, how much you want to fight for us despite all of our own shortcomings, Lord. Um, in the times that we worry, the, we, we, where we worry of how we come off or if we're worth being around, I pray that you remind us again and again just how you see us, the love that you have for us. I pray that we can look into your eyes and see again just the warmth of your, of your embrace and of your presence, Lord. I pray that going forward, Lord, we can um, cling on to you, Lord, and really see, Lord, that in your arms, Lord, we are enough that you love us um, and that you will walk with us um, now and forevermore. So I thank you again for this time, just for your continual love, for your mercy, um, and for your son, Christ Jesus, um, as well. We thank you, we love you, and Jesus, we pray. Amen.